Hello, everyone, and welcome to this morning's um, Techno Crime Fighters Forum. This is episode 31 of our series. We're so happy you're here and watching us live. I'm here today with Dr. Millicent Black and with Karen Stewart. We're hoping that Dr. Catherine Horton will join us shortly from, I'm not entirely certain where she is exactly, somewhere in Europe, either Brussels, Brussels. or Zurich. Brussels, I think it's Brussels. right, Karen? She, Brussels, yes, so she did Brussels. go to Brussels, and so she may still be in Brussels. Okay, so, and I know that she has some um, very important information to share with us today about her trip to Brussels and about her being present at a very momentous occasion, the birth of a friend's child, a very important friend whom we know because she's on our team as well, uh, Melanie Richen, who is the founder of ICATOR. So we'll hear more from Catherine about the whole thing. And I know Millicent will want to chime in at that point about issues related to targeting and children and newborns. So today actually is going to be a focus on this whole phenomenon of targeting with electromagnetic weapons and neural weapons, which is running under cover of mainstream media coverage today, which is being kept highly secret, but which is uh, absolutely going on. And we have an insider from the NSA to attest to it, as we know. And we're all very grateful to Karen Stewart for having stepped forward and for continuing to speak out. And in Thank fact, you. this, absolutely, Karen, we need you. And we are so grateful for your voice and for your confirmation of what is going on. Because thousands of people around the country today and around the world, in fact, who have come forward, who have reported the crimes being executed on their person with radiation being directed at their bodies 24 seven nonstop in absolute lunatic style um, have all been disbelieved and dismissed and discredited as delusional, as schizoid, as schizophrenic, as paranoid schizophrenic, and on and on. Uh, various other labels, choice labels pulled out from the DSM, the fraudulent DSM and handed to highly educated people who are reporting these crimes by um, either complicit doctors and psychiatrists or clueless doctors and psychiatrists, people who are simply not informed, people who are undereducated about the state of surveillance in this country and in the world today. So Karen, uh, first of all, we have to thank you for something remarkable that you did yesterday and which you posted on Facebook and which, you know, many of us remarked almost immediately because we all happened to be on Facebook at just the same time, which was fortuitous. <laughs> <laughs> so we could I respond. noticed that. <laughs> That was interesting, was it not? Because I usually am never on Facebook and I just happened to be on Facebook yesterday morning. So I was able to take your post actually and put it on my timeline and share it because for some reason, no one could share it from your post. The share button had been removed. Uh, so I put it on my timeline and I think people could share it from my timeline. And I enc encourage people to go to my Facebook timeline and check it out and you know share it from there. So what this post was, was a response to WebMD. Now, WebMD, as people may know, is a kind of a medical online community. It's a, a website that offers a huge bunch of information on, you know, medical ailments and treatments, symptoms, and also lists doctors that people can go to, etc. All sorts of information. I haven't checked it recently, but I do know that it's a very useful site, right, for many people. Um, yes. Usually. Isn't it? Usually. Usually. And so it's interesting that um, WebMD apparently is characterizing targeted individuals as people suffering from mass delusion. So it's so ex uh, exquisite that you stepped forward and corrected them on this wrongful notion that those who are reporting serious surveillance abuse and surveillance crime, who are indeed being targeted, by a conglomerate of agencies, local and state and national, and are also being used non-consensually in a whole bunch of different, highly ghastly, horrific uh, human experimentation that should not be going on, but that is, unfortunately, and that these people are struggling to expose. Um, all of them are being simply dismissed and discredited as suffering from mass delusion. So uh, mm -hmm. I think this is a very mm -hmm. important subject and one that we have to one that we have to address very, very uh, persistently and consistently. So 
Did you want to talk a little bit about your actual pose, Karen, and what exactly you wrote? Um, well, it's I, I could actually just read it, and then people could hear what what I had to say. But I will right. tell people I I've had a couple of nights where they've ramped things up, and I woke up the other morning. Uh, I tell people I woke up swinging, you know, and I said one of the things I wanted to tackle was uh, the reports from people saying, you know, I have friends who looked it up on WebMD and told me I'm crazy and get help. And I was just furious. I mean, if you don't know about a new phenomenon, you don't fabricate things to cover it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, exactly. Um, I, you know, you investigate it. You just don't assume, you know. So, yes. like I and said, I it, wanted to go ahead. Does it imply, therefore, that the people who wrote that up on WebMD are people who are indeed fabricating this information or are putting out disinformation? fraudulent information, false information? Well, I think what happens is that these people are held up as experts and then they get a question they don't know. So they fall back on something uh, easy. I mean, look at the fact that the there are several, I mean, I don't even know how many articles now have been written about the sonic attacks in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And then after, you know, maybe five to 10 articles came out, then somebody went to psychologists who had not even spoken to anybody who was attacked in Cuba and had them write up a, a, an article that basically said, well, maybe these people are suffering from mass delusion. Hello, mm -hmm. it's too late, horses out of the barn. And what that article looked like was that it was just plain pathetic. And I think it took a while for them to get somebody to contribute to the article they intended to write, you know, mm -hmm. and I think it took a while for them to get any expert who would jump in and risk his credibility. But they found somebody who was, you know, just dumb enough to say, well, I don't know anything about it. And I've never spoken to any of the people. And, uh, but I'm just going to say that it's just, it could be delusional, because I don't know about it. Yes, I think, um, you know, I think psychologists and psychiatrists who, who speak in this fashion and who publish in this fashion need to be called on it. And I will make um, some efforts, definitely, to contact this particular person who wrote this article and see if he's going to step forward and get on camera and respond to me and, uh, and uh, respond to this whole scenario of um, sonic being hit by sonic weapons or suffering from mass delusion. Right. And also, uh, like I uh, mentioned to you early this morning, there is a, an email that I just saw uh, that's talking about signing a petition to outlaw non-lethal weapons. And having spoken to Paul David Galbots, who's a military expert, he's retired now, but he used to guard the facilities where these things were being tested. And he says, yes, they're mobile now. But, uh, <laughs> you know, these and and. Um, 60 Minutes, I guess, interviewed somebody, excuse me, <clears throat> interviewed somebody concerning the non-lethal weapon, somebody from the military, and he watched the 60 Minutes, and the the person was saying, yes, these are non-lethal, and he contacted 60 Minutes and said, I want to tell you they are lethal. They were de designed to be lethal, and they are lethal, and if you turn them down, then they're not immediately lethal but they were designed to be. So he lied to you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's just absolutely ridiculous for police and military who know about these weapons to tell us that we're delusional about them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're finding the effects, we're finding the symptoms, and then finding out these uh, weapons exist for the most part, mm -hmm. not the other way around. People are not discovering they exist and then fabricating stories about them. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is absolutely totally impossible for this to be a mass delusion. Mm -hmm. And I point out um, very often that you cannot have a it, it's medically unsound to say that people across all races, ethnicities, genders, cultures across the world are imagining exactly the same thing. No. If you have a village somewhere, and uh, if um, they see an airplane and they've never seen an airplane before and they go back to their own mythology, maybe they have a mythology about dragons. So they see this thing fl flying through the air. They've never seen one before, never heard of it. So the whole village imagines that it's a dragon. Okay, that's mass delusion because they all have something in common and they all have misinterpreted something they had no knowledge of beforehand.
So that's understandable. But when you have uh, somebody in Zimbabwe or India or Canada or um, Greenland, you know, or South America, and they're all giving you 80% the same type of situation, you know, that they're describing, that's not a mm -hmm. mass delusion. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. So I do point that out in the letter to, to WebMD. Um, yes, let me get and and, and the, the thing that I thought that was exceptional about that letter, many things really were exceptional, mm -hmm. but one of the things that stood out for me was the term that you used, the targeted individual scam. And I think that's absolutely accurate because there is the targeted individual scam afoot. And that scam has people from law enforcement taking people to psych ward mm -hmm. when they mm -hmm. are coming forward to report being hit with electromagnetic radi radiation mm -hmm. uh, instead of instead of believing what they are saying and instead of investigating and exploring in this day of you know massive use of electromagnetic radiation in every form around us with microwaves and wi-fi cell towers satellites etc we are inundated we are living in an electromagnetic soup everybody knows that technology has advanced to this point where we are using electromagnetic radiation for various various uses in our everyday lives and so the part of the scam has to do with law enforcement yes dismissing and reports and then there's psychiatry you know there's the whole there's the whole field of psychiatrists which we really have to tackle we have to hold psychiatrists responsible and accountable for these misdiagnoses that they are happily handing out which are absolutely false they yes. need to be put on the spot well, we are making inroads a little bit. All right. I, um, I had a friend in Florida um, for about three, four years, and we're still friends. And she happened to be a psychologist. And I had met her and befriended her before all of this started happening to me in regard to the directed energy weapons. But it was after NSA had abused me and, and fired me because I had dared to go to the inspector general. Um, so mm -hmm. she knew about that. And then when I started getting targeted, she did have her her doubts. And she may, she basically wrote me a nice letter. And she said, I at first wondered, is my friend, you know, schizophrenic? And then she said, after she listened to me, uh, she decided, no, something r real is going on. And at one point in time, she and I were sitting on her back deck at a table the size of an ice cream table. So we we're sitting rather close, but we we're watching, uh, sitting outside, enjoying the nature and looking out over the lake. Mm -hmm. Notice that uh, when I would go to visit her, NSA or their proxies would send somebody out on a boat to hit me while I was visiting her. So I had started to explain to her, I'm not going to stay very long because I don't want you to be injured. And at one point in time when we were sitting together, apparently somebody in the, in the boat mistook her for me and hit her with a weapon. And she reacted to it. And I said, oh, what's what's wrong you know and she said oh my god and she said something just hit me and i said well what what has happened and she said i have never experienced this before she said it feel it felt like something drilled into my ear into my brain then realized maybe it was the wrong brain and drilled back out again and then she reported you know a day or two later she said do you know that i hurt for like six or seven hours that evening oh my goodness so not only was she able to judge that in the three years that I'd known her, I'd never said anything peculiar, um, which a, a schizophrenic person really is known to not be able to have a thought that they can continue. They will bounce around subjects. You know, like if I, if I were schizophrenic and I knew one in college, then I would come up to you, Ramon, and say, hello, Ramon, how, you know, how are you today? Do you like flowers? I love flowers. I especially like yellow flowers. Hey, look at that. There's a wrench on the, on the ground. Wonder who dropped that? You know, oh, did you see that bug in the air? You know, mm -hmm. they just cannot follow any type of logic in how they communicate with you. So mm -hmm. do any of us sound like this? I don't think so. So they're trying to put that label on us is unsound medically. Mm -hmm. And I think they know it, but they're desperate to not be shown to not know anything about this. So they grab the first tool available and, uh, 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 oh, yeah, schizophrenia, that's it, you know. And so they're being dishonest. This is an ego thing. They don't want to say, I don't know. So they say whatever they think might fit and uh, blow people off. Oh, it's schizophrenia. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. And then they won't Medicine, be shown to not know what they're talking about.
Yes, exactly. Melissa, did you want to comment on that? I, I do. I was visiting actually with um, two employees at a domestic violence center in Ohio, and I began to be hit. And I don't know what happened with my mannerisms, but they could tell it. And one of them, the, actually, she was the supervisor. She said to me, uh, is he hitting you right now? And I said, yes, he is. And she said, well, I can tell it. And the other lady that was with us said, yes, I can tell it too. And I asked them if they would please document that they could see some change because I was being prompted. Uh-oh, we lost your... Mm -hmm. We're losing your audio, Millicent. Yeah, there's a... The other thing that was significant is, um, Romola, when you were mentioning the, the involvement of the police department, you that the Mount Pleasant Police Department had four former military employees on that force when I was being so harassed by some, but, but very believed uh, and documented by others. But it wasn't until I actually filed the lawsuit that I discovered one of them actually told me, the police investigator actually told me that he was a Marine. Uh, the, the sergeant who talked to me the most told me that he had helped the CIA do LSD experiments on the Vietnam Jeez. veterans when he was in Marine intelligence. Uh, but it wasn't until after I filed the lawsuit that I found out that the female part of that force, who was actually the domestic violence representative, So you see there were, um, all of them were familiar with the weapons, familiar with the technology. And I actually then came across a, a newspaper for the, for, that, uh, for the town that announced in 2009 that they had acquired a non-lethal weapon. So it's not unusual that the police forces are, are talked full of um, former military veterans who actually know about and maybe even have training in the technology because I do know that uh, some documentation through research that police departments can also stop an engine from running. Well, that's with military technology. Um, and also in, at that same domestic violence agency in Ohio, that's where I was told to not be surprised if I couldn't get the desired uh, outreach outcome when I filed my complaint, because she said so many former military veterans are actually on police forces and they're very slow to investigate each other. Um, at the same time, I had a Navy chaplain tell me that it's called fraternization, what they're doing. So he said to become very familiar with military law so that you can file complaints there as well. So those are the two things that I, I wanted to add to what was being said while y'all were, were making those um, the comments earlier. Mm -hmm. But specifically when Karen said that the doctor that she was with could actually feel the, um, the assault because she was mistaken for Karen, it was important that I add that that was just one of the events or the occasions that people could see mm -hmm. that I was being assaulted based on my reaction. Yes, and I think we've established definitely, you know, Dr. Nick Bigot has written about it, and I've explored some of that in my articles. There have been um, memoranda of understanding between the Department of Defense and the Department of Justice to permit the mm -hmm. use of certain classified non-lethal weapons by local law enforcement. So that information is actually not being shared with the general public. And I know ACLU recently has been doing some work in trying to get a list of what weapons really are being, what devices are being used for surveillance. Um, I also did a bit of that. I tried to do, I did a FOIA with the Massachusetts Fusion Center to find out what surveillance weapons were being used on the streets. And they wrote back saying no responsive documents. And actually what they really said was, uh, we can't share information for reasons of public safety. <laughs> can't share that information with me, a journalist. Uh, so if they don't want to share it with, you know, a, a writer and a journalist, um, that really means they don't want the public to know what they are using. Yes, because if they were honest and told the public, by the way, the non-lethal weapons can be lethal, 
And if we abuse them, they certainly can be lethal. And even when we're using them the way we're told to, we may accidentally kill a few of you, or we may accidentally severely injure you. But they want to go with this non-lethal lie. Mm -hmm. There are so many lies, and that is most definitely one of the big lies. Non-lethal. These weapons are, in fact, lethal, as Paul David Gobatz has come forward to establish for us. And as many others, I think, have said, it's, uh, it's in terms of measure of usage, right? Measure of intensity of usage that determines lethality. Yes. yes. Um, length of time and the strength at which it's used. I mean, if you take a radar gun, which is not generally mm -hmm. considered a weapon, and you sit outside the wall of somebody's home, outside their bedroom, and use it on them all night, you may be able to kill them. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're caught having done that, would the police really say, gee, you know, a radar gun isn't actually a weapon, so the fact that you killed somebody with it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's so what that's they're telling us. That's one of the huge lies and deceptions that has been put forth here, and that's being kept under wraps. The, the fact that non-lethal weapons are in actuality lethal, but are being attempted to be used non-lethally in lower increments of intensity and duration. Right, right. Well, they're telling, they're telling people it's okay, they're non-lethal, and, and it's a lie. If I had the letter that was written for, for me and for other targeted individuals by Lynn Sagala, who was the past vice president, Oh, yes. She's the other big whistleblower who's spoken out about it. Yes. She says, she says very specifically that they're not, that it's not non-lethal. And she says that what we're dealing with is not experimentation, but it is slow kill. And she's very specific about saying if certain people are involved in it, then it makes it a greater crime. Like if they are law enforcement, it makes it a greater crime. If they are military trained, then it also is a greater crime than just slow kill or just murder. Um, and she also emphasized that the international, it's an international matter and, and there is an effort to get the international courts involved in it. She herself and another and a group went to speak with the uh, United Nations regarding the use of, these of this technology. And she was also instrumental in helping to write uh, HR 297 which is the Space Preservation Act that was written by Dennis Kucinich and introduced to Congress in 2001. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about the Space Weapons Preservation Act. Yes, I think your audio was blinked out just at very key moments when you were speaking. Yes, I can hardly hear you all, so I'm not sure how well I'm coming through. But I also wanted to tell you of, of a website that I found just this morning. It's called Citizens... For Community of, for the Community of Human Rights, Citizens Community of Human Rights um, or Committee of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is actually have, they have a page that allows you to file a complaint about psychiatric abuse. Oh. Yes, I and, do and know and that, CCHR. And I think actually we should talk to Dr. Seth Farber for his views on CCHR because he understands the, the landscape much more closely than we do. Um, I'm not entirely certain if that is um, the best website or the best recourse from things that he has told me earlier, but I, you know, I can't vouch for what he has said. So we have to, um, I, I would love to interview Dr. Farber on our show at some point. Well, I've sent the link to you and, and Karen this morning since we've been talking. So take Excellent. a look at it. And if you think it's valid, you can put the link at the uh, end of the podcast today. Well, Excellent. you know, we'd be happy good. to put the link out for everybody, I'm sure, for everyone so people can see it. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely certain how useful they are, is my, is my question. Okay, I yeah. understand. Yeah. So, um, non-lethal weapons actually being lethal, as we know, is one big aspect of it. And then there are so many other lies associated with this, the um, neuro-surveillance, that neuromonitoring is going on, which most people don't know about. This is considered exotic or a conspiracy theory to some people. So that's another huge subject, you know, that's a huge area. 
and um, and mind control, of course. You know, these are words, these are almost like trigger words for some people. They hear the words mind control or neuromonitoring, monitoring and they think that's conspiracy theory, not realizing the actuality of what's going on, some of which can be attested to um, in John Sinclair Alkwai's rather landmark uh, lawsuit against the NSA in which he disclosed so much information about the signals intelligence program of the NSA, which is in, in fact, according to John Sinclair Akwai and some other, other whistleblowers who have come forward, who, who are really monitoring the brainwaves of everybody um, in the country and possibly the planet, who knows? Uh, so <laughs> yeah, just, it, it, that's crazy. I mean, you've got basically a whole criminal uh, cabal that's hiding behind the legitimate activity of NSA. And I'll repeat that the NSA was founded to listen to foreign agents on foreign soil who they thought meant harm to the United States. Once that agent came to the United States, they were not allowed to listen or surveil him anymore. And the information had to be passed to the FBI, whose jurisdiction it was. And if that foreign agent was still in a foreign country, but was found to be speaking to an American citizen, then the American citizens part of the conversation had to be deleted. So that is the proper charter of the National Security Agency. It is not to do studies and spend millions and millions of dollars into mind control of its own citizens or the mind control of people in the world. That's not their business, you know, because the vast majority of people are innocent people just trying to live their lives. They're not there to be controlled like chickens or cattle. Mm -hmm. That's outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous, but as we know from everything that we have learned from Robert Duncan's whistleblowing, for instance, um, you know, the NSA is working with the CIA and with the DOD and the DIA on these programs of monitoring people's brains, monitoring their thoughts, using remote um, surveillance, neurosurveillance, and so on and so forth. I should also point out at this point that the Department of Justice is also heavily involved and has, in fact, many programs where they are engaged in predictive policing and are looking into the brains of people. And whose brains they are looking into is, is highly questionable because are they looking into the brains of criminals? Or are they looking into of, of criminals with a criminal record? You know, that's a label too. So let me watch myself. So people who have a criminal record, who've been caught out in criminal activity, or are they looking into the brains of people who are teaching in universities, who are writing novels, who are working at, um, you know, as nurses or as substitute teachers at the local high school? Are they looking at the brains of pretty much everybody in, in the country instead? You know, and this is, this is something that's actually rather public and some neuroscientists, again, with DOD connections, obviously, these, this is where it's all, you know, the collusion becomes very obvious and, and uh, overt. Um, you've got neuroscientists working for the army, now working for the Department of Justice, engaged in predictive neuroscience, predictive policing, pre-crime, just like Minority Report. Well, it uh, also looks like that. they're in. Go ahead, Melissa. A memo came out in 2005, uh, and the, the title of it was The CIA and NSA Create Criminals. And that's where I <laughs> yes. think that's the really uh, nefari nefarious um, use of the NSA or remote neural monitoring, is, that's where it comes in because they have. There are people who are actually able to be brain to brain linked with just the victim, with someone that's chosen. Well, let's just see what we can make her do. Uh, I've actually had conversations with one TI who says that's exactly what they do to her in the night. They say, well, let's see, can we make her be a thief? And then they'll just start questioning her about that. Or maybe in a store, they'll just begin to put thoughts out in the air in the store to make people think that she's thinking about stealing and she is that's far from her mind um so just being able to make people think you you're thinking about something when they really aren't your thoughts is something that could get you taken into into uh police custody for questioning you know what i'm saying it could get you falsely accused of of uh, of, of thinking of stealing something when they're not your thoughts to begin with yes that's the 
That's a very That's important a point. Yes, but the new technologies with the BCI and brain-to-brain -brain technologies, you're right, it's a two-way street. They can just as easily pump in ideas and thoughts into your head as pull them out. Well, Absolutely. this is pr also, they can provoke people or set them up and then they go, oh, see, we told you that person was criminally yeah. bent, uh, mm -hmm. despite the fact they never had anything as far as a criminal record their entire life. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, so thought policing is actually a huge joke because obviously, as you both have pointed out, there's opportunity to manipulate that space. And I'm very surprised that neuroscientists aren't aware of that. Or, you know, it certainly seems that if they are aware of it, as you would think that they should be aware of it, perhaps this is all another aspect of the collusion here, the collusion, the complicity and the cover up, uh, which is most definitely ongoing. So you know the question has to be asked we have i think i saw a news article just last week about and i don't know when exactly this came out it may have been a little while ago actually um about neuroethicists debating about these issues of mind rights and coming up with a list of um problems associated with reading people's brains now i would like to ask why exactly are neuroethicists quote unquote considered the first last and only speakers on the subject Going to affect every single person on the planet, right? <sighs> you this know, is it, true because they have an agenda, and we do not. We, the intended victims, do not have an agenda other than life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, why is it our input is not welcome? Yeah, or anybody's, anybody's, the entire planet's. You know. A, a, this is this is obviously an issue for all of humanity. This is the kind of thing that should be a matter of public debate. It should be published and printed in every newspaper. Every every television channel should be talking about this. Every radio show should be talking about this. People should be able to give public comment through a multitude of different forums. You know, scientists cannot make decisions for all of humankind. And, and yet sure. that's exactly what's going on. Exactly. That's unfortunately exactly what's going on. So because of that, there's a lot of cover up and people don't really know what's going on. And therefore, this whole phenomenon of targeted individuals, doctors and psychiatrists need to snap out of it, need to get woke and really fast and need to start getting educated on what's going on in the, in the vast realm of surveillance. Some really horrific and dirty surveillance is going on and running under cover of surveillance is 24-7 uh, assault with electromagnetic radiation, carcinogenic radiation being directed at human bodies. That's what targeted oh, individuals yeah. are experiencing today. And they are not delusional when they report this. They are reporting a simple fact. And in addition, they are also being neurotech and mind tech. Many are reporting V2K, as Chris Burton's story demonstrates. Voice to skull, constant, non-stop verbal and psychological torture with a voice being put into your head. And, and, in any, in, in, and if anybody out there at this point in time associates hearing voices in heads with schizophrenia or delusion, you really need to wake up because there have been articles published even in mainstream media, really, about um, military technology, microwave technology, and at this point, ultrasonic technology as well. So we have both right. ultrasonics, microwaves, being able to induce voices in people's heads. And also some people need to remember the speaker. Yes, people need to remember uh, the invasion of Iraq where they talked about or bragged about uh, a lot of Iraqi soldiers they tricked into surrendering to them by using the quote unquote voice of God weapon that basically was a voice sent via microwave into the heads of all of these um, uh, military, Iraq military, that said in Arabic, this is Allah, drop your guns and surrender. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, are they going to backpedal from that? Them. I'm sorry, it's the same thing. I followed in the footsteps of Donald Friedman in making a four-year request to Army Intelligence and Security at Fort George Meade and did indeed receive documents that I now have filed in my county courthouse that confirms microwave hearing and microwave heating. The microwave heating occurs as the signals are traveling the skin to the brain. And it says if a person did not know better, they would think they were hearing voices. 
I also would want to add at this point that it's very dangerous anymore to take a psychological exam where you are filling out by self-disclosure or self-reporting whether or not you hear voices. And they ask it in so many different ways. I, I noticed a couple of times as I have taken psych eval, uh, the number of times that they're asking, the number of ways they ask if you've heard anyone talking to you. Do you have thoughts that flood through your mind? Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. When I know the technical uh, reason for these things happening. And so obviously I would advise anyone if they were having uh, what we know is voice to skull and you can prove that it's voice to skull to never answer those questions directly. Or at least never answer those, those questions because they aren't correctly posed to you. They should be asked uh, have, have you heard any uh, voices that you cannot identify or have you heard any, anyone speaking to you or had thoughts put into your mind based on any other um, medical condition? You see what I'm saying? There should be a, a way to add the, uh, um, what is it? To give the, the uh, express uh, extension to that question whereby you're able to explain but this is why I, have, I hear a voice, or this is how I know that it's not just hearing a voice, but someone specifically directing their voice to my head. And here is a patent, or these patents are to the US military. But you see, those kinds of explanations are not allowed on those tests. And so if you answer them just by the, you know, just off the cuff, then you're gonna be making yourself appear to be, in their eyes, someone who has a mental illness. Um, and they would never believe your explanation, or even if you showed them the patents, um, except for those psychologists who are ethical. And I have had one or two. I can, I can tell you that specifically. I've mm -hmm. had a couple of ethical psychologists. That's excellent. That and, and they said very specifically, she is not delusional. She is not paranoid. She is not hallucinatory. And she is not dissociative. Yes, absolutely. And if any doctor out there is listening and wants to know what document this is, it's um, it's called Bioeffects of Selected Non-Lethal Weapons. It was supplied on Donald Friedman's foyer to either the was it the NSA? Um, it was it was Army Intelligence and Security at Fort George Meade. Wonderful. And that's where NSA is. Which is NSA? Okay, Army Intelligence at at uh, at the NSA. Well, they're facility. co located. Oh, I see. They're co-located. I see. Okay. So they're not exactly the same thing, same body. Along with, I mean, along, along with the Naval Security Group, which is nicknamed the Silent Warriors because they use directed energy weapons for war, but they also have mobile devices. Interesting. Yes. And I understand the Navy is actually very involved and we'll talk about that in just a minute because they are doing and they've been doing all sorts of experiments and research projects using sonar, radar, and all sorts of other um, radiation weaponry as well. So to go back to that one document, though, it's bioeffects of selected non-lethal weapons, and you can find it. It's declassified, and this is why Army Intelligence supplied it to the people who asked, Donald Friedman and Dr. Millicent Black, uh, because they decided to declassify it, I think, in 2006 or something, right? Very recently. And uh, it, it actually spells out a whole bunch of different technologies. But it's very, very vital to look at because it talks about microwave hearing openly, you know, which is the Alan Frey style uh, kind of microwave hearing. There are so many other microwave hearing technologies now. And as Millicent pointed out, there's a bunch of patterns online that you can go to and find them. There's, there's lots of different kinds of tech that are able to put voices into people's head, um, including ultrasound action. The neurofilm. And I was thinking again to mention a high um, quality stereo that uses Holosonics, H O L O oh, Sonics. Yes. I mean, you can buy yes. it if you have the money. You can buy that type of thing what, that basically transverses from source A. Let's say you've got it in a corner of your den and mm -hmm. maybe the kids are playing and they don't want to hear Beethoven, but you want to sit in the other corner at the opposite end of the room and read and listen to Beethoven. So you buy a stereo that's got holosonics and then you mm -hmm. program it to play the music in your corner, which may transverse where the kids are, but the kids aren't going to hear it. Mm -hmm. 
So that's yes, a and um, commercial application of this technology. And how are they going to say, oh, it doesn't exist? Yes, and there are a few different commercial asp um, you know, applications. And there are several websites, actually, that, are, um, that have been advertising this information. So this information is actually online. And I can't quite, f can quite find the, the, the link that I'm looking for right now. But I'll um, find it and put it on, put it uh, below this video later. What you can also do is go to my um, recent article on Chris Burton, and I've added in a little page in the middle of the article uh, that I've linked to rather, and it's just about voice to skull technologies. Uh, something very interesting, really, something outstanding about voice to skull, which as we know is a military term and um, has been defined by the military, is that in 2008, Sharon Weinberger wrote an article in, in Wired.com marking the fact that the definition for voice to skull devices had been removed from the military thesaurus online. It's very interesting. But that particular definition was actually screenshotted and archived in a couple of places. One is the Federation of American Scientists, um, and the other is... Um, ChristiansAgainstMentalSlavery.org, I think. Oh, there UK. we go. So I was able to get the screenshot uh, from those places and, um, you know, make a mention as well of the Wired.com article and include that in Chris Burton's interview because I thought it's very appropriate to include. So if anybody hears the term voice to skull and thinks that a certain delusional targeted individual uh, engaged in a mass delusion with other targeted individuals invented it, well, no, that term comes straight from the US military. They had a definition of it online and then they yanked the definition. Why? That's the question I'd like to ask. Why exactly did they remove, remove it? Was it perhaps because they preferred to keep, they decided after a while because, you know, they had it up and then they removed it. They decided after a while it might be better to completely erase all mention and awareness of this so that the little PSYOP with calling TIs mass delusional could proceed at a better pace. Oh, yes. So I think that's what's going on, which is a long way of saying we've come a long way from talking about your WebMD article, Karen, so we really should listen to it. We should hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I mean, that's fine. I think we needed to go where we went. Um, well, I did, uh, I posted this and it says, uh, uh, under targeted individuals, you state these people are mentally ill, suffering from mass delusions. No. I used to work for the National Security Agency, the NSA at Fort Meade, Maryland. Post 9-11 laws are being purposely misinterpreted to say that since we, the USA, reserves the right to kill terrorists anywhere, anytime, that if we lower the criteria to less than probable cause in regard to the terrorist watch list, which was done in 2013, then thousands of random people can be put on the TWL, terrorist watch list, no questions asked. DHS has made a separate for-profit DHS entity and is selling kill contracts on innocent people to buddies in the military industrial complex to torture and kill to test on humans weapons like gases, poisons, directed energy weapons, nanoparticles, sec secreted medical chips, and even networks of chips that according to the Pentagon comes in torture protocol one through five at least. Another protocol being used is to order law enforcement to write off anybody who complains of stalking harassment and being tortured as crazy, and they are forbidden to help the person denied constitutional rights. InfraGuard vigilantes, under the auspices of the FBI and the fusion centers, are paid to stalk and harass the victims so that the harassment mimics what one-dimensional psychologists immediately assume is schizophrenia, delusions, paranoia, when it is not. This constant harassment was perfected by the former East German commu communist secret police, the Stasi, as psychological warfare to destroy dissidents. Since there is millions of dollars to be made from using non-consensual human experimentation, even to lethality, this program is viciously covered up 
with an intricate network of paid conspirators. The DHS has even developed another protocol to take out life insurance policies, trust funds, and joint properties in the names of their intended victims, as was done to the 9-11 victims. I know I worked at NSA during 9-11. Dernza General Michael Hayden and his deputy William B. Black Jr. knowingly squelched warnings for six months in order to take out almost 3,000 life insurance policies on the people who worked in the Twin Towers before they were killed, and both are heavily involved in the targeted individual scam. If you will not correct your own disinformation, the ludicrous impossibility of hundreds of thousands of people sharing a mass delusion, which we know is medically impossible, then either say the cause has yet to be proven or take down the lie that is adding insult to injury in this new techno holocaust that you are now aiding and abetting. And yes, four, four psychologists have given me a very sound psychological evaluation. So yes, that's the end you. of it. I just wanted to preempt them going, oh, you're crazy. It's like, no. How many yeah. people have four psychologists who have um, basically assessed them and said there's nothing wrong here? Mm -hmm. That's brilliant because, you know, that's sort of the language in which you know, you're just kind of speaking their language because that's that would be one of their first accusations, right? Here's somebody who may be delusional herself. But, you know, Karen, I can't imagine anybody daring to question your credibility or your um, absolute sanity. So <laughs> um, just well, anyone to speak, speaking with you. I appreciate that, but um, I've had trouble with uh, police just the same as, as others, you know, and I've, at some point in time, I've spoken to, poli to police. I thought, does your IQ even have three digits in it? Because they just were uh, so difficult to talk to. In fact, yes. one police detective in Tallahassee, Florida, listened to what I had to say. And then, you know, you pardon my characterization of him and the voice I'm about to use. But his answer to me was, <laughs> I don't think anybody from Tallahassee worked for NSA. <laughs> and oh, I thought, my God. dear God, dear God. And this is a detective. Yeah, this is a detective. He blew me off after a lengthy explanation by the fact that he could not imagine that anybody who had ever lived in Tallahassee, Florida, could have gone on to work for the National Security Agency. That is so odd that he would be speaking to you and saying that to you, with no awareness, apparently, of who you were. No. No, well, I told him. Mm -hmm. And he, he, refused told him. To, he refused to credit you. He refused to believe you. Um, exactly. And a huge bunch of misogyny, and they're mixed in, no doubt. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the Leon County Sheriff's Department was, of course, absolutely <laughs> just basically incompetent and stupid. You mm -hmm. know, they had the same attitude that, uh, oh, you're a woman. Basically, you couldn't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, exactly, that's, it's absolutely horrifying what's going on. And, you know, it's, it's uh, what you have been, what you have been faced with, essentially, is what everyone else, you know, is the same runaround that, that everyone else is given yes. from the local police that, you know, this is not happening, you must be delusional, let me, let me call the psychiatrist immediately. And um, there are so many stories, so many uh, TIs at this point have come forward and have established that this is what's going on with the local police, which really makes one question various things. For one, you know, we know that the local police is using classified non-lethal weapons on the populace. That's been established. Yes. Two, they're also using non-classified lethal weapons on the populace. As we all know, they carry them in their holsters and they also use radar guns. So they've got non-lethal and lethal both that are in the public domain that, that have been acknowledged, you know? So these yeah. guys are armed to the hilt, both with both radiation weapons and with conventional lethal weapons. So given that, and uh, you know, given of course the long-standing um, pact, I should say, that the law enforcement has supposedly made with the American public, they're not supposed to use weapons in the American public. But they are supposed to protect the American public from the use of weapons on them. 
And so it becomes doubly ironic, the people reporting the use of weapons on their person, the use of radiation weapons on their, on, on their person, are being given you know, no, no uh, chance for an audience with local law enforcement who are yeah. persisting, you know, persisting in saying, we don't know anything about it. We're not using it. We've never heard of it. Directed energy weapons, we've never heard of it. <laughs> we don't know anything about energy weapons, radiation weapons. Did you say you feel you're being hit by an energy weapon? Let me put you through to the local, I don't know if they have a psychiatrist on call per permanently in each department or how exactly they do it, but somehow a psychiatrist materializes and people are, in many cases, forcibly carted off to police stations, forcibly carted off to emergency rooms, forcibly carted off to mental institutions. And imagine... These are the kinds of stories we're hearing. Yes, yes. And imagine somebody saying, I'm stupid. I don't understand what you're saying. Therefore, you must be crazy. I mean, essentially, that's what they're saying. Now, they did, uh, I think people know that uh, with the article that you wrote, that they did try to do that to me because they didn't understand, I, you know, directed energy weapons or they pretended they didn't. Because I had said to them, look, the same thing that you're saying, look, how many veterans have you hired onto the um, Leon County Sheriff's Department? Uh, how many veterans have you hired uh, onto the Tallahassee Police Department? Surely some of those were in Afghanistan or Iraq, and they know about or even used directed energy weapons that were mobile, at least. Mm -hmm. So why don't you contact them and ask them about them? Did they? No. And in Tallahassee, Florida, you've got two universities, FAMU and FSU. They both have physics departments. Do they know about directed energy? Of course they do. In Tallahassee, Florida, they also have something called the MAG Lab, which conducts research on electromagnetic radiation. Do they know about them? Of course. Did they consult any of these people that I told them to consult? Of course not. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, <laughs> one uh, sheriff's deputy, Panasuea, who is apparently uh, Samoan, uh, decided to try to Baker Act me. And so they did attempt that. And when I spoke to the psychologist, he basically said, go home, you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. So I got, I returned home and I sent them emails saying, nice try, but the psychologist actually is smart. Mm -hmm. you yes, know? And, I, you and know. they said, well, we disagree with him. I'm like, really? You and your high school education that is needed to become a deputy, you disagree with a professional psychologist? And, you know, we should point out that this is a huge abuse of power. Yes. Local law enforcement has been given some power in our communities. And using that power, they are handcuffing people. They're arresting people. They're throwing people into, into the backs of their armed police vans. They're carting them off to the local police station. They're forcing them to do a psych evaluation. Why? Because they decide that somebody has a psychological problem when they can't quite understand, as you point out. Well, the you know, they could. And the technology. Yeah, they had all the uh, opportunity in the world to research this and find out that it was true, but they wouldn't. Mm -mm. No, they wouldn't. And that's so that actually brings me to the point that I wanted to make that, um, you know, either they're ignorant, as we have explored just now, or that there is a specific and distinct agenda ongoing here. And I, 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 I'm sort of inclined to the latter because it, this appears to be prevalent across the length and breadth of the country and, in fact, the world, because this is a protocol that's being followed now by local law. Whenever people mention they're being hit by EMF weapons or radiation weapons, which they are, they are being given the runaround by local police and being taken to police stations, taken to mental institutions, taken to psych psychiatrists and psychologists. Even when they're shown That's, meter readings that are outrageous. Yes. I, mean, I, uh, I went to, I had totally given up on the Leon County Sheriff's Department as being a pack of morons and had gone to the local uh, fire department and I took mm -hmm. my recorded meter readings because I, I filmed them and I took them to the fire department and I said, this is what I'm getting at my home. And they looked at it and said, oh my gosh. You know, mm -hmm. and, and at that point, you know, I said, well, do you understand what this means? Do you have a hazmat team? And um, they wanted to come out to the house and they asked their hazmat team, which unfortunately was one man. <laughs> and I'd explained it to them. I said, wow. this is non-ionizing radiation. 
okay? Not ionizing. This is non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation, and it is just off mm -hmm. the charts, and this is dangerous. And so they actually sent a fire truck and asked the one man who was their hazmat team to come out, and he brought a Geiger counter, which, of course, is only for ionizing radiation. Well, right. they were out there trying to decide what to do, and I had told them their mistake, and a Leon County Sheriff's deputy, who was an older man, came out there and told them to not take a look at the meter readings, not conduct any of their own, and to leave because I was crazy. Now, oh my, my, meter, my meter readings that were shown to them alarmed them. So on their own, they knew something was wrong. But the Leon mm -hmm. County Sheriff's Department did not want somebody else coming out and saying there is a problem here because it didn't mm -hmm. fit their agenda. Now, mm -hmm. my question is now in, in getting to know Janet Phelan, who's another journalist, and she has done research on judges who can be bribed to make a court case go one way or the no another. And the way that they bribe them is that this judge will take out, let's say a judge makes $160,000 a year, and he takes out a $500,000 loan from the people who want his favor, and he quote unquote repays it in a year. Well, how did he repay it in a year if he makes $160,000 and it's $500,000? Yeah, really well, it's written so off because it's a bribe. So I would like to know how many of the people in the Leon County Sheriff's Department at the upper echelon took out loans and miraculously paid them back without enough salary to do it? Because definitely, mm -hmm. in my case, they were squelching any attempt to bring facts into it. So that is what mm -hmm. is done, I think, with everyone. Yes. So yeah. I think the upper echelon police and sheriff's department aren't stupid, they're corrupt. Now, this translates to the guy who comes out to your house as he's just being told in the morning meeting, so-and-so is crazy, just blow them off. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a high yeah. school educated person who doesn't know anything, has no sophistication whatsoever. And he's just, he has black and white thinking, one-dimensional thinking, and he just does as he's told. Mm -hmm. It's entrenched corruption, as you say, um, Karen, you know, if that's what's going on, because it's that's across the board. It's not just the Leon County Sheriff's Department. It's possibly oh, yes. various it's, other sheriff's departments, you know, various yes. other yeah. departments across the country. That's entrenched and that's a network. That's organized crime at its best, it sounds like. You know, it is. If Catherine and, were here, I'm sure she would be talking about the deep <laughs> capture at the higher yeah. levels. Well, let me tell you about how many TIs have told me, oh, we had a wonderful sheriff in this county, but he died of a sudden brain tumor or sudden heart attack. And I said, what? Because in Leon County, there was a sheriff that was very much a constitutional sheriff, and he died of a sudden illness. And I thought, oh my gosh, is it possible that the sheriffs who stand on the Constitution are being hit with directed energy weapons and murdered so that they can yeah. put their own sycophants into the high positions yes. of sheriffs? Yes, they're little yes boys and yes girls in place. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's entirely exactly what's going on, because ultimately what's happening is we, we're seeing a system both of organized crime, entrenched corruption, political psychiatry. This is political psychiatry. If there is an existing um, agreed upon protocol to cart everybody reporting electromagnetic radiation crime on their persons, to cart them off to, to a psychiatrist. That's political psychiatry in action. And mm -hmm. for that, we have to hold the entire field of psychiatry accountable. You know, we have to hold psychiatrists accountable. We have to hold the medical profession and the medical community accountable. How is this possible in a democracy? Are we living in a democracy? Is that what's happening here? Or is this an oligarchy or a communist kind of setup and it's just got the skin and flavor of a democracy going and we've all been fooled by it? I think it's been eaten out like a rotten apple and everybody thinks that it's a beautifully uh, pristine, wonderful apple. And if you take a bite into it, meaning if you go to use it, if you go to try to get uh, your legal rights or constitutional rights, you very quickly find out the apple is rotten because you mm, are severely exactly punished. Right. You are severely punished for trying to mm -hmm. um, use your rights. 
-hmm. file a lawsuit, we're going to punish you. Call the police, we're going to punish you. Report a crime, mm -hmm. we're going to punish you. Right, to your senator, everything... they're going to, they're going to yes. punish you. Yes. Um, you know, it's like uh, people will say, okay, um, this has to sit on the shelf and look nice. You can't actually use it. You know, yes, I, mean, I think that, that's is... a brilliant analogy. Yes, that's yeah. what's going on currently. Yeah, the mm -hmm. big shiny red apple of democracy sitting on the shelf. And when you actually look at it, it's all maggoty and eaten up inside. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's eaten up by these entrenched criminals who are sitting inside our agencies and our law enforcement departments and pretending to be, you know, law enforcers and pretending to be sheriffs and pretending to be um, heads of intel agencies, all watching out for our greater good then it's exactly the opposite that they are working on and accomplishing. So I think, the, I think it's fantastic that we are actually speaking openly about this. And I think it's great that you wrote that to WebMD and, uh, you know, spurred and sparked this conversation. Because to me, it's one of the most primary conversations that we need to keep having, which is what exactly is going on with surveillance in this country today? Why is it not being spoken about in the newspapers? Because it's not being spoken about in the newspapers, it's being buried and people are not speaking about it. So I think it's important to keep reviving the subject and sort of bringing it to the fore continuously because there are people all around the country who are being wrongfully surveilled, wrongfully targeted, and wrongfully trafficked into deadly research and experimentation projects where they are being hit 24 seven with deadly radiation and deadly V2K and verbal and psychological torture. So this is actually, these are torture programs, these are kill programs, these are genocide programs that are ongoing, and um, no human being who has an ounce of humanity, basic humanity in them, could possibly condone these programs, which really begs the question, who on earth approved these programs? Who on earth approved them? How human are these people who are <laughs> not, approving not these very. programs? Not mm -hmm. very. I call them counterfeit humans. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I see Millicent is trying to get back in. And I think Millicent, so. we don't quite hear you. I just heard a kind of a staticky sound. Yes, I, I just wanted to oh, there she remind, is. I guess, add to add to what, what was being said about, about making those reports is that. Sure, go ahead. Even when, when I had police officers who were verifying to me that they at least understood. Um, they still had to abide by what the chief said. Uh, I had at least two different police officers say to me, we asked to be allowed to investigate, but the chief won't allow it. Ah, he's getting oh, kicked back. Interesting. And, and, yep. and there were two different ones at two different times. So like, it wasn't like maybe mm -hmm. they went together. Like yes, and I think that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant point to point up, you know, that there are good policemen in our law enforcement units, but they are uh, possibly a minority or they possibly don't have enough of a voice. The guys above them apparently are running the show here. I think so. Well, I also recently spoke with someone on, on a military base who essentially said, you know, we hear you, but I've got a wife and children at home and I've got to be able to take care of them. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So as we all know, you know, there's this uh, horrible connection with, with the intelligence agencies, with um, with the Masons and the Fraternal Order of Police. And, you know, this is the other thing. We're talking about secret societies actually running these agencies rather than uh, what we see on the surface. Mm-hmm. This is true. This is the indication. And I call it a, a death cult. It is you know, a death cult. That with, with these weapons, they could kill anybody they wanted to. So now uh, I will say that when I was working at NSA, there was one lunch conversation where somebody, it was a friend of friend, said that he was highly disturbed to find out that NSA uh, had moles in every office of any congressman or senator who they thought might vote for or against something that they might have an interest in. And I thought that is absolutely, I totally treasonous. I, I read it that the police force had to have at least one intelligence slot on their force. So if they're expected to hire someone from some military intelligence on their slot, uh, in, on their force, 
The other well, thing this is like is the SS. In 2011, by a police investigator, he said, wait a minute, I thought this was an experiment. I said, but I never agreed to be anyone's experiment. And then just this year, someone else said to me, well, what they're doing is watching your reaction, but they're not watching my reaction because my reaction is skewed by being tortured in my, in my pelvic area and my pubic area and, and my leg. You know, they're not watching just a, I mean, it's, it's one thing to have a rabbit walk across in front of me when I'm just sitting there and nothing else is happening. It's totally different when a rabbit of me and someone uh, suddenly stabs me in the, in the leg or shocks me in my spine so that I jump, then it's going to look like I have a desire to run after the rabbit. But that's not true. I just got shocked in my spine and I jumped. Exactly. Very good point. And, you know, clearly these are bogus experiments. And I should also say what you are talking about is also pointing to that whole phenomenon of trauma-based mind control, which, as Absolutely. we know, came out of MK Ultra. And uh, when you, when anyone hears those terms, trauma-based mind control, everybody gasps and think, my God, which anti-human concocted that? And we know which uh, anti-humans concocted those horrific experiments. They were the MK Ultra guys. They were the CIA, you know, and all the psychiatrists who worked with them. So, and the army psychiatrists who worked with them. And however, the it's... The Mitchell. Yes, yes. Who various other... Million dollars. Mm -hmm. All the sponsors of those experiments, yes, of course. And then again, it comes back to those secret societies, those sex and death cults who've been practicing from inside the agencies and most definitely from inside the CIA as well. So there's all of that. And then you look at the present day and look at what's going on and you begin to realize that the, um, those MK Ultra experiments, which supposedly went uh, disappeared, went off the map in the 70s, merely went underground, as many writers have come forward to, to inform us about, including Alex Constantine, you know, who's written extensively about this. Um, they've gone underground and then they've resurfaced. And you know where they've resurfaced? They've resurfaced in the Air Force Research Laboratory, the Naval Research Laboratory, the D DARPA, the DOD, and the NSA. And now it seems trauma-based mind control has become perfectly acceptable in certain circles, in certain military circles. It's perfectly acceptable to use trauma-based mind control to engage in neural network mapping and remodeling and trying to figure out how people's brains work and create cognitive models of people's brains and download them to computers and download human brains to computers and so on and so forth. So all of this deadly brain and experimentation is going on currently, thanks to DARPA, thanks to the CIA, thanks to all this undercover classification and keeping it under wraps. And yet, this, this phenomenon is not being remarked on. When, when people come forward in, in our society and report that they appear to be victims of ongoing experimentation, which is not letting up, you don't have our educated professional class, you know, getting concerned forward, listening, taking reports, working with the ACLU, working with Amnesty International, working with the DOD, working with the CIA to get these experiments stopped. No. What you see instead is people at the Bioethical Commission, Amy Gutman, who I think was Chancellor, perhaps, I forget the exact uh, title that she had at the University of Pennsylvania. She headed the commission, closing their years, Amy Gutman and her friends on that board, the entire bioethical, so-called bioethical commission, President's Bioethical Commission under Obama, set up to find out if horrific non-consensual experimentation was going on in this time period in America. That board, that commission, listened to the voices and, and the cries, the pleas of Many of several, almost, I think there were 60, 40 to 60 people who spoke at the two meetings of the Bioethical Commission in 2011 and simply turned a deaf ear and in fact issued a statement, we won't any longer be listening to the stories of targeted individuals. These are issues for, um, for the Department of Justice. What did they think? That it's okay to hit, uh, to hit people with weaponry and get away with it and, and, and uh, refer it to the local police station? This was the Bioethical Commission. Oh, so, everybody's finger pointing and saying it's his ju jurisdiction, not mine. And they hope to buy mm -hmm. time by doing that. Mm -hmm. But what a whitewash. What a cover up. Oh, How yeah. could a commission that 
ha that had apparently been set in place to address this particular issue, how could that commission simply turn tail and flee in this fashion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ramola, I actually, uh, I actually attended the March the first meeting. And yes, you did. Meeting. And and when I began to research the commission after the meeting, I discovered that twenty five percent of them had affiliation with with my former employer, with Vanderbilt so University. Research, by the way. Yes, uh, non consensually. Exactly. A exactly. Yes. And, and Very I did, interesting. I did and you see, that's why it, it leads right back to the medical community and how complicit they are. Yes. It does. And I did have an opportunity to ask the question about what weight they place on the importance of, of the IRB, which is the Institutional Revo Review Board's approval of human subjects. And during the discussion, one of the doctors said that the people in Guatemala Oh, by the way, they didn't. Un they would not understand what we were trying to give them. <laughs> so at that point, Anita Allen, wow. who also works from at the University of Pennsylvania, spoke up and said, "So you mean to tell me you could not have gotten an interpreter so that they could understand?" Seriously, see, well, they can't really understand. Yeah, well, they, they were trying to give them gonorrhea, gonorrhea right? They <laughs> to get their approval, they did not tell them what they were getting, and they had no IRB approval. Uh, How could they have gotten IRB approval and then had so many people die of the disease and so many people who were affected, uh, 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 afflicted, affected by it in such a, uh, such a horrendous way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was exploitation, pure and simple. Yes. And let me add that after that meeting, they were invited to a luncheon with the Marines who were in the very back of the room in a glass encased room there was a whole set of Marines waiting to have lunch with them. So do you think those Marines were just scoping us out to see who would be best for their next round of, of experiment? Mm. Well, why were the Marines present to start with? Why were they present at the Bioethical Commission, um, you know, deliberations? Exactly. How did they know to come to that place for them? And why, yes, why were they waiting for them afterwards? Not one of them showed up in the room during the meeting. Interesting. And when we turned around, they had all gathered at the back of the room in a glass room that was where, where we could see them all there in uniform, by the way. Of course. Intimidation factor. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the Marines, you know, we should also think about the intelligence agencies working in the military department. So could it be the intelligence guys hanging out among the Marines? You know, that's the cover story, the Marines for that time period. Mm, they can. <laughs> They can, the NSA will send people. The met with them after they met with us. That, that's the, mm. the whole thing that makes it look so, so much less real or so much less um, valid. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole investigation piece. Was it just a ploy to get us in, especially since FFCHS had such a uh, you know, such a national name by then, and there had been several attempts to go to Congress and to hold meetings on Capitol Hill. Were, was that all just deployed to get us in so they could take a closer look at us? Or like I said, look for, look for what are the experiment ta experiments that they could place us on, especially those of us who, who spoke out. Or, you know, just to be present, because you see, they have all these, um, you know, I'd like to see what the military directives are, really, because they have all these, if you look at some of the um, waivers in the common rule, because apparently there are waivers of informed consent for almost every department of the federal government, including every department of the military. And they, sli they word it slightly differently. If you go look at the code, um, I'd love to know what precise directives they are following. Did, perhaps they needed to be present when they are subjects were reporting their experiences? Jeez. Ah, now that doesn't make me feel so good. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps they were, perhaps our signature on those forms to speak could be used as signatures of informed consent. My God, there's so many things I had not thought about. 
Yes, yeah, it's it, exactly. And that's a very important point as well, Millicent, because, you know, most people, when they go to the doctor, everybody's used to signing a little form that says, you know, I hold you free of liability or whatever for, for this uh, for this um, knee operation I'm going to have or this whatever operation you're going to give me. And people don't think twice that signing that particular form, that form is actually possibly being misused and being seen as permission for some deadly, dastardly, um, secretive COVID ops experimentation. And that appears to be how um, people are being rolled into these because so many people who've gone into hospitals for surgery are coming out with the, the experience of being chipped, the experience of being stalked, the experience of being followed, and the experience of um, discovering implants on their body being activated. I can tell you that every you know, this Every time I had surgery since the year 2000, including the year 2000, I came out with, with a verifiable place that of an implant being in my body, in the exact location of the surgery. Um, can we just have you say that one more time, Millicent, because you were, the audio was blinked out. Sorry. I can verify that every time I've had surgery since the year 2000, including the year 2000, there was an implant identified in that area of the surgical skull. That's incredible. And I do recall covering that when we wrote that, when I wrote that article. Um, so literally after every surgery, an implant was placed during surgery so that later on you discovered that the site of the surgery also housed an implant. Exactly. Jeez. What does that tell you? You know, what does that tell us in America today? It tells us clandestine covert operations in the operating room are alive and well. Mm -hmm. And again, it doesn't matter if it's a directive, a regulation, or a law. If it's unconstitutional, it is void, according to Marbury versus Madison. Mm -hmm. So this is legalistic sleight of hand. Yes, it's legalistic sleight of hand. It's color of law. And it's also a massive cover-up, you know, it's classification in the interests of national security. It's sources <laughs> and methods of gathering intelligence. And again, so these federal law lies. says, yeah, again, federal law says you cannot cover up crime by invoking classification, period. Yes, and so somehow we need to get that across to the people who matter. Because what's really happening is these intelligence agencies, military intelligence uh, and military departments, you know, from the Marines, the Navy, they're all engaging in contracts for um, weapons testing, millimeter wave weapon testing, microwave weapon testing, ultrasonic weapons testing, biobehavioral research, you know, um, using these weapons, etc. All of these agencies and military branches are literally preying on the civilian populace. Mm -hmm. that they're tasked with uh, protecting, period. I mean, the main mm -hmm. function of government is that you appoint people to make sure your society is not attacked from with, without or within and destroyed mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that people can have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You are not mm -hmm. possessions of a government to be experimented on because your assets are possessions. No, and the absolute goal of places like the Bioethical Commission coming out, you know, 40 years after Guatam Guatemala and uh, apologizing. Oh, wait, am I getting that confused with Clinton? I think he made the big apology, right? Um, right. So, so, you know, coming, coming by 40 years later and saying, oh, yes, we acknowledge that uh, we engaged in some experiments and some lives were lost and they were bad even by the standards of those times, etc. And we apologize. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. That's not but we're enough. going to be doing it again because we find that it's a very good system where we do what we yeah. want. And then a few decades mm -hmm. later, we go, oops, my bad. Yeah. So that, unfortunately, is what is going on now. And this is why our educated professional class, our brothers and sisters who went to the same schools that we did, the same colleges that we did, and yet have been successfully brainwashed by NPR and by the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune into maintaining absolute obliviousness about this matter. They need to wake up fast and recognize non-consensual human experimentation of the most horrific type is currently ongoing, neuro-experimentation of the most horrific type is currently ongoing, and deadly EMF 
assaults with electromagnetic radiation weapons and sonic weapons is currently ongoing. People need to wake up. People like my sister who came to live, uh, who came to visit me last week, need needs need to wake up. She's a doctor. She's an ophthalmologist. Okay, she has an FRCS, an FRCO. She's worked at the best hospitals in London. She's uh, got a post uh, doctoral something or the other from Harvard University in genetics. She worked at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore for several years. She's a great genetics researcher in the realm of um, ophthalmology, something to do with the retina, and um, you know, obviously smart, educated, um, etc., and yet has no awareness whatsoever of non-consensual human experimentation ongoing, of electromagnetic surveillance ongoing, and of implants being placed on people and of um, satellites being used, of cell towers being used, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, when someone like me, her own sister, who is working as a writer and journalist in the space, comes forward and uh, mentions that this is, in fact, going on, she runs out of the room. She literally ran out of the room when I was speaking to her last <laughs> week because she didn't want to hear it. Yeah. I said, you know, you need to get educated, and she ran out into the backyard. Cognitive <laughs> dissonance. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, we're running into people with... Uh, basically terrible educations or very low educations. We're running into people with obstinate cognitive dissonance and we're running into people who are so very educated that their own egos get into in the way of them understanding new material. Absolutely. Most definitely in action here. <laughs> no, it's, it's disheartening. I had one relative. I mean, I've been lucky in that most of my relatives are supportive, but I had one relative whose eyes basically glazed over and said, well, why don't you just unplug some of your electronics and maybe you'll feel better. Oh, yes, I've heard that. Yes, <laughs> unplug your electronics. My sister's line is, you need to get off the computer. You're really sitting with the computer way too long. Get off the computer and, you know, enjoy the garden and you need friends. And yes, I do need friends. I would love to have some friends, but uh, that's not happening as long as you are targeted. As long as you are targeted, yeah. you are defamed and slandered in your immediate, immediate community. You know, to the right. extent I, that you don't even want to speak to the people who are speaking to you because they are patronizing you. They're treating you like a mentally ill person. So this scenario of targeting is so off the charts insane. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's such a massive cover up that I'm absolutely shocked that journalists out there, you know, with half a brain cannot see what's going on and cannot break free of the organizations that are paying their bills and cannot become independent and start writing and publishing about this because we need those journalists. If there are journalists out there, and I've said this before, I probably am repeating myself because this is absolutely my, you know, this is my pet subject over here. Journalists and media, you know, if, if we had journalists and true media covering this, this situation would not be so massively covered up as it is currently. That's what we need. We need people who can see what's going on, who have a curious mind, who have an investigative bent, and who have the integrity to commit to some serious investigation and writing and you know publishing and broadcasting about this. If, if people keep ignoring the phenomenon of targeted individuals in society, I'd like to know how exactly they think that they can move forward because there is no way forward in understanding the uh, landscape of surveillance and the landscape of non-consensual human experimentation today without understanding, exploring, and exposing the whole phenomenon of targeted individuals. No, there's not. And I think there's a good reason that modern day uh, people refer to the media as prostitutes. You know, the quality is gone. Now, if I were in an organization, knew about this, then I would try to have people get together, try to say, if we all come out with a story about this, then we can't be picked off one by one. We will have come out en masse, and it's going to be hard for these evil people to come against us unless they basically out themselves. And if they out themselves, then it's up to our military, I think, to take out the domestic terrorists, if that's what they want to show themselves to be. But 
you know, they're just basically ducking and covering and hoping that the bad stuff goes away or flies over and, and leaves them alone. Well, that happened, that worked real well in Nazi Germany, didn't it? You know, people were turning a blind eye as to when the Gestapo would come and drag their neighbors off. You know, and at first they told themselves, we don't care, we're not Jews. And then the people with conscience who said, I don't care who they're dragging off, they don't need to be dragging anybody off. And then those people got dragged off, you mm -hmm. know. And so it, eventually it, their whole country was destroyed. I spoke to a man whose family lived in, in Germany and for several years they survived on eating weeds, nettles. He, he said his mother cooked nettle soup or they would have starved to death. He and his brother went out to pick weeds so their family had something to eat after um, Germany was destroyed. So, and I would tell people, look, I have spoken to people who have served in the military, who have even famous relatives who were admirals or generals. Uh, I worked at NSA. Um, people who have worked in the federal government are targeted. People who've been in the military are targeted. People who, I mean, there, nobody is exempt. If you're saying, oh, that won't happen to my family because I'm too important, mm -hmm. guess again. Guess again, it will and can happen to anybody, everybody. And at a certain point in time, these people are going to come out and say, we run everything. You do what we say or we're killing you overtly because now we're, we're in charge. But that's what's going on right now. And I think what's happening is people need to wake up to that fact precisely that you were talking about, Karen, that people from every walk of life are being targeted. People in the military are being targeted. People who have uh, definitely whistleblowers are being targeted, right, from the intelligence agencies who've mm -hmm. left are being targeted. Um, people in the medical community are being targeted. You know, those who are, those with integrity and conscience who have spoken out about vaccines and so forth um, have found themselves under fire and have been targeted by their own colleagues, their own peers. And um, people, people in academe have been targeted. People in every walk of life are currently being targeted. People in Hollywood have been targeted, right? We have several cases. And yes. in fact, everybody knows that Hollywood, I mean, it's, um, I think David Icke put out a video that says Hollywood, the cesspit, a cesspit. So that, that word comes to mind. But, um, mm -hmm. You know, it's unfortunate. You have all these beautiful people, you know, on the silver screen and uh, all of them are being controlled and being used and treated in the most dreadful of ways, assaulted, abused, exploited, etc. So that kind of exploitation is everywhere across our society. And we have these secret societies hiding around in our intelligence agencies, exercising power, wreaking power, you know, abusing power over the rest of us. And indeed, that is the message that everybody is getting speak out about us and you will get targeted too. So shut up, put up and be a team player. You know, Justin Carter, as, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Justin Carter, the whistleblower from um, a security, a private SIS. SIS, thank you, is a security industry specialist, etc. Right? Is that what it's called, incorporated? Special, security industry specialist? Um, I think so. Okay, so he stepped forward recently and he's put out a second video or a second podcast or at least tweeted it out that I listened to recently. And he's talking about how he's really a whistleblower from inside and he's talking about how private security companies are now engaged wholesale across the country in targeting Americans with electromagnetic weapons and with neural weapons. <laughs> So it's very important for people who are new to the subject to go and check out his podcast because I think he's revealing a great deal. And he, I admire him hugely because he comes right out and he slams the people who are doing this. And he says um, openly that what they are doing is execrable. You know, what these people who are being paid money to carry weapons in their backpacks and in their cars to pursue targets from room to room, from house to house, from street to street, from store to store, and hit them on all parts of their body, including their brain. These guys have lost their humanity. They've lost their conscience. They've lost their morality. They have lost their minds, seriously. Because what they're doing yes. is hunting down other Americans, their fellow Americans. And, you know, we can extend this to the world and say they are fellow civilians, they are fellow, they are fellow residents on the planet, they are fellow humans. Yes. Assaulting them, they have so Absolutely. It's, it's, well, again, I'll use the, uh, the example of the time travel movie where they have Morlocks and Eloy, where the human race is split into Eloy, which are extraordinarily um, innocent, 
good hearted people. And then the Morlocks who survive by preying on them. And they're subterranean monsters. And that what we're looking at is very similar. Exactly what's going on currently. We are see, we've already been split into this predator prey society where you have these people working in teams. These are death squads. And, you know, Dr. Eric Alstrom shows the connections between the Phoenix program of the 70s and what's going on now, what Marshall Thomas also has spelled out as the new Phoenix program. This is what's going on undercover in our cities and towns and rural areas all across America and all across the world, really. Mm -hmm. This is the new Phoenix program of the new world disorder you know yeah. so this is what's going on with the new the, the globalists and the agenda 21ers who are really the corporatists and the um, the bankers and the ones who um want to hold power over others and want to genocide others etc cetera, etc cetera, who are really attacking humanity mm -hmm. and so we this is what people need to know those who who are new to the subject, who cannot barely believe that electromagnetic weapons are being used on Americans or on others, and who cannot believe the neuro weapons are being used, that neuro experimentation is going on, well, actually, go listen to some whistleblowing, will you? Go listen to Kevin Shipp, listen to Justin Carter, listen to Karen Stewart, all of her very many radio um, talk shows and appearances and so on, and listen to our own conversations on this, on this forum for the last... 31 episodes. This is our 31st episode, Karen. Yes. <laughs> Which means we've been doing this for a few months now. Right. It, and it was a great idea, you know. Uh, so many people don't sit down or have the time to sit and read that they love to listen, you know. And so True. this is a, a wonderful venue. Yes, and I'm very grateful to Dr. Paul Marco for having set it up and permitted us to keep running for such a long time. And now, of course, it's running on my own channel, which is great, but we do miss him and we miss um, Catherine. Hopefully we'll see them both um, next time. Um, you know, so I do think it's a great forum. But people do need to wake up and start um, getting educated about what's going on because you're not going to get that education from the New York Times. The New York, New York Times appears to be expressing the agenda of the globalists. Yes. Thoroughly dishonest. Yes, it's not speaking for America and the American people. So it, it's pathetic. It's tragic. But that's the situation we are faced with today. You know, I had to go through a whole period of waking up myself because I, in the, in the 29 years that I've been in this country, had this awareness of, you know, NPR and PBS and Democracy Now! and Pacifica and... Um, the New York Times being my media of choice, being the ones that were liberal and progressive and aware. So you see, I equated aware and truthful with liberal and progressive. And I have since woken up um, hugely ever since I've been targeted and, and figured out the huge sham that's in place here in the media and the huge amounts of cover-ups everywhere and, and the politics behind everything that's published. So, and, you know, understanding now what corporate media is and whose interests they are really expressing. So, you know, I think other people also need to go through that learning curve. You need to kind of figure out what's going on because you're not going to read about it in the New York Times. New York Times is not covering this. And if it ever does cover it, as you know, Mike Maffet covered it at one point in time, last uh, summer sometime, I think June 2016, uh, with his um, ridiculous article, United States of Paranoia. Right. Where I call him Mr. McFake. <laughs> Absolutely. And did he not interview you? And then he did not even present your information in the article, right? No, he didn't. Um, we spoke and I told him my entire story and he didn't use a word of it. He had no intention of telling the truth. Yes. And I think he actually mentioned you in one paragraph, but he did not mention that you were an NSA whistleblower, that you nope. were a nope, retired just... intelligence analyst? No, nope. nothing. No, he just, he made sure to mention my name. And then tried to smear me as one of those. Yes. And he didn't give any information about me whatsoever except my name. So it was a yes. total setup. Yes. And that, unfortunately, is what these newspapers are doing. They are smearing the names of credible whistleblowers and um, credible speakers in this space who are drawing attention to the reality of excessive electromagnetic surveillance and neurosurveillance, which is being kept incredibly under wraps. 
by corporate media. So, you know, people need to kind of dig deep and dig a little further and um, start sifting through and beginning to think for themselves and trying to figure out what on earth is going on with targeting. And, you know, we are trying to point the way here. We're trying to point the way to what the, to what the truth is, what really is going on in this country. So that's all I have to say on that subject for now. We've sort of come to the end of an hour, uh, Karen. Is there anything else, any loose ends that we should um, wrap up at this point? Um, well, I wanted to just repeat a quote that says that tolerance is the last virtue of a dying society. And I would say we're in this mess because now homogenous societies that all pretty much agree on what is moral and not moral tend to function very well. Um, if you introduce all kinds of different belief systems in a country where assimilation is not emphasized, then you start to say that tolerance is the highest virtue. And then you come across people who say, well, uh, my belief system is that the guy next door has no value to me unless I am able to figure out a way to use him. And that is the value system of a psychopath. So here we are in a country that basically has said that any and all values are fluid and there is no black and white, therefore there is no right and wrong. And so we have predatory science and predatory capitalism. Yes. So I need, need people to think about that because tolerance is not necessarily a virtue in this case. No, there's a lot of moral relativism floating about, you know. Exactly. And that has fueled this, unfortunately. It because has. the government, the government and the military industrial complex have done this before and it becomes increasingly bigger and bigger. Uh, they got away with it and then said, oops, sorry. Then they did it again and then said, oops, sorry, when they were discovered. And they just keep thinking, we'll just do it. We won't ask. Uh, permission, we'll just do it and then apologize afterwards when we're, when we're discovered. Mm -hmm. Yes, except so that's that, what's going on. That is what's going on. And also what's going on is something that's even more sinister than that, because we're talking about covert weaponry. So mm -hmm. if, if a power group wishes to keep a certain cache of weapons secret for a very long time, we're speaking about neuroweapons and electromagnetic weapons, both of which are covert. Well, basically, neuroweapons use radiation, you know, and, that's re and of course, they use BCI systems as well, covert implantation. Shouldn't forget that. So, um, and of course, not in all cases. I know there are people who will jump up and say, oh, you don't need, you know, implants to get into people's brains, etc. Yes, yes, I know. I'm just talking about the, the whole range of tech over here. So when you have these covert technologies and you have a power group that's seeking to use these covert tech against another group, which is really the larger group, the majority group, you know, then you have a very dangerous situation. And I think that's where we are today. We are in a state of... Um, already rampant totalitarianism, which is ramping up to become even yes. worse, even worse, you know, because once these weapons are permitted to be in the, in the hands of these people unacknowledged, the situation is going to get much, much worse. Everybody is already being targeted, is my understanding, but I think everybody is going to become targeted in a much more severe way. And the threat of these weapons is going to grow exponentially. So what you're seeing today with all of this team playing, and you know, um, hang in with us and do what we do, say what we say, you know, and uh, go after that person because they are the target and we are the team going after the target. This is how they're corralling communities through Neighborhood Watch and Citizen Watch and all of these other bogus programs, countering violent extremism, etc. You know, pumping all sorts of weird ideologies into the minds of the compliant populace the populace who's being taken into their confidence and who's being permitted to uh, actually use these weapons on others, you know, who's, who's entering that predatorial space, who's using these weapons on others and on whom these weapons are being used, as Justin Carter points out, you know, in his, in his podcast. They're also, the, the gang stalkers are also being stalked. They're also being targeted in a kind of a punishing kind of way. If they don't do what they are asked to do, then they're punished. You know, this is sort of Lord of the Flies all over again. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, the, the situation is already pretty extreme. It's pretty execrable. It's atrocious. 
This is not, you know, the free America we've all thought of and dreamed of. Um, this no. is total totalitarian, totalitarianism at this point. And it's going to get much worse if people don't wake up, get educated, and start speaking out and stopping it. I think these secret societies and these intelligence agencies and these military groups have got to be stopped. I think the medical community that's engaging in non-consensual human experimentation on civilians has to be stopped. You know, because if it's not stopped, it's just going to continue and everybody's game. Exactly. I agree. So, you know, people do need to step forward. And I do hope we've given you something to think about this morning. And I know that many of the people watching us are on our side and I'm grateful for that. But the rest of you, those who are, you know, listening to us in a kind of a curious way or faintly interested way or speculative way or exploring way or investigative way to all of you i say you know please investigate and explore this further you know get get the truth and the reality of what we are talking about because we wouldn't be coming here week after week spending two hours of our very precious time to discuss these issues were they not absolutely true agreed so on which note do you have any final words karen well i would like to ask anybody engaged in the stalking um, to maybe take one of their devices and take it over to their victim or take it to the police station and say, I was told this or that. Is that true? And this is what I've been told that I should be using on this person. Is this non-lethal? Is this uh, for listening? Or is this actually killing them? Because I do believe I've been duped uh, if they have indeed been duped. Now, some of my... Uh, think know very well that they're killing you because there are rewards I think offered uh, for offing the person. But for those few people who might be able to say that I was told this is a listening device, is it? Take it to them or, and I hate to say the FBI because they're mostly involved or take it, you know, to another authority and say, what is this? You know, and I was told I can use this on, on Joe Smith over here. What is it actually doing to him? You know, so think mm -hmm. about doing that or something or talking to the people that you're doing this with in your neighborhood and all of you are bringing home big screen TVs and new shoes and things like that. And if these devices are killing the person, is that big screen TV and big pair of shoes, you know, Gucci's or whatever, is that worth your soul? Is that how cheap you are? Is that what it takes to make you a traitor to your country and to humanity? So I would like for them to think about it a little bit, if there's any humanity left in them. That's brilliant. That's really brilliant. I do hope people listening take your advice. Some of them, definitely, your conscience has got to be woken. Those of you stalkers and death squatters out there watching us, may you wake up if, a little bit. If you don't have a conscience and this doesn't affect you, you're lost. You're not human anymore and don't even think that you are. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And the other thing that I wanted to actually um, commend you for with, that you mentioned earlier, and I wanted to stress a that a little bit, was the advice that you had for journalists. Perhaps a few groups of journalists could get together and expose targeting together. You know, And we who are being targeted stand by ready at any time to help you with information if you want to come out and you know cover the truth about this and if you want to come out and cover just a fraction of it as i know some people have then that becomes problematic because we're talking about a very intense and a very horrific program and the 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 easiest thing to do is simply to expose the the truth and the reality of it so i i would like to second what karen said earlier about you know advising journalists out there researchers out there if you can't uh, if you can't expose it on your own you know because you fear for your own lives and your own skins in case uh, in terms of uh, worrying about becoming targeted yourselves um, then maybe work together as she suggested I think that's a fabulous idea so on which note <laughs> plenty to think about so I guess we'll come back next time and you know hopefully we'll have a bigger panel and um, we'll definitely hear all about Brussels the next time with um, Catherine and um and millicent, millicent will be here again yeah she had to go off for surgery so she had to bow out in the last few minutes oh i see okay 
All right. I hope everything goes well over there for her. I do too. Yes. So on which note, thank you everyone so much for watching us this morning. Um, keep doing the good work you're doing. If you're a warrior in our camp, keep speaking out, keep educating those journalists and uh, psychologists and psychiatrists. And um, we'll come back very soon and talk about uh, ways that we have devised or are currently working on to handle just those very issues. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.